So uh, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, welcome to today's webinar, MISRA C++, a subset of C++ for the development of high integrity systems. I'm Lavinia Battaglia, the customer service representative here at Bakteng, and our speaker is Roberto Bagnara, who is CTO and chief scientist at Bakteng, other than a very passionate computer science professor at Parma University. Not only, Robert is also a member of the MISRA C Working Group and of the International Standardization Working Group of the C Programming Language. Uh, before we start, please note that you can write all your questions in the Q&A section, which is on the left of your screen, and please do so throughout the entire webinar. So at the end, we can read the questions straight away and use that time to reply uh, to as many of you as we can. All right, then, let's turn this over to Roberto. Thank you very much. So let's start uh, this uh, uh, webinar, uh, which has been prepared uh, together with Chris Tapp, who, among other things, is the chairman of the MISRA C++ working group and is also a member of the MISRA C working group. So here is uh, the outline. So we will first go through some behaviors that are not completely defined uh, uh, on, MISRA, on C and C++, which is the, reason, the main reason of existence for MISRA C and C++. We will also see some historical background. Uh, we will do uh, a part of the presentation to understand uh, what is MISRA C++ uh, about. In particular, we will highlight the, the differences between uh, compliance to MISRA C++ and bug finding. And we will talk about the past, present, and future of MISRA C++. So first a disclaimer, as I said, the authors of this presentation are members of MISRA groups and of ISO groups. However, uh, the views express expressed in this presentation are uh, the one of the authors and not necessarily they represent the views of the working groups uh, uh, we have mentioned. Okay, so the first uh, question, I always make this question. Do you want to reason in assembly code? Or do you want to reason in C or C++? So if you are here, I guess that uh, you opt for writing your code and reasoning about your code, uh, uh, well, writing it in C and then C++. So uh, C++ has uh, several advantages. Uh, it's portable. Uh, compilers exist for many processors, uh, even though not uh, all processor. C++ is a multi-paradigm language, so there is an imperative fragment, uh, object orientation, generic programming. There are several things in it. Uh, someone thinks there are too many things in it. Uh, C++ is defined by an ISO standard, and compiled code can be very efficient. C++ is increasingly supported by tools, uh, and it is largely, com largely compatible with C. So this is good and bad. It's uh, good because uh, compatibility is always good. However, uh, because of this compatibility, it inherits from C uh, corresponding advantages and disadvantages that now we will review. So the advantages of C is that C compilers exist for almost any processor, so even more than C++. It's also defined by an ISO standard. Uh, Differently from C++, C compiled code is very efficient and without hidden costs. So in C++, things are different. If you uh, invoke uh, maybe implicitly a constructor, then anything can happen. So the cost uh, is not obvious from the source code. C allows writing compact code. There are many built-in operators, uh, and so you can write quite complex things with limited verbosity. And uh, with extensions, maybe uh, C allows easy access to the hardware. C has a long history of usage included in uh, critical systems, and it is widely supported by tools. So uh, C passed uh, some of its disadvantages to C++. And, and these are uh, due to the spirit of C, which has always been uh, a spirit where uh, language is such that the programmer has to be trusted, the programmer is in charge, the programmer gets the right to do anything, to do the job, uh, and 
and uh, speed uh, is uh, favored uh, uh, with respect to portability. And many of these things are bad for safety and security requirements. So let's see where the problem comes from. So here I make reference to the C++ 2003 uh, language standard. So the issue comes from the notion of observable behavior. Uh, the observable behavior is defined uh, as a sequence of reads and writes to volatile data and calls to library I.O. function. So, and uh, the important thing is that uh, the compiler has, uh, has its only obligation, the one to respect the observable behavior. And in fact, the compiler will obey the so-called as if rule, whereby it is allowed to do any transformation that ensures that the observable behavior does not change. This is, of course, not only true for C and C++, but it's true also for many other languages. And in particular, it is true for all languages that admit an optimized compilation uh, implementation. So because in the as if rule, there is latitude for the compiler to do the optimization. Okay, let's uh, uh, start with uh, uh, the uh, most dangerous variety of uh, behavior, which is not defined. It's called undefined behavior. It is behavior that is engaged when uh, an erroneous program constructs or erroneous data is manipulated. And when this happens, uh, the uh, C++ standard imposes no requirement meaning no requirement at all, so anything can happen. The program, the program can crash, the program can engage into erratic behavior of any kind, it may even format your hard disk. This is what is said to people who doesn't get it. So when undefined behavior is there, there is really no constraint on what can happen. And uh, what this is uh, the case because the compiler assumes that undefined behavior does not happen. If it does happen, it is a fault of the programmer. The programmer has violated the contract with the compiler, so there is no uh, warranty whatsoever. Let us see an example. One of the uh, behaviors that are undefined in C++ is when an attempt is made to modify a string literal. Here we have a small example. A string literal is a, 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 a literal constant. So in this case, hello, with three exclamation marks. Uh, and this program attempts to modify the string literal by casting away constants from the string literal and then writing to it. So the intention was to remove two of the three uh, exclamation marks by inserting uh, a um, line terminator, sorry, a string uh, terminator, a null character. Um, however, the, what happens is that the behavior is undefined. Why? Because string literals uh, may be stored in read-only memory. And so trying to write uh, to read-only memory may result into an hardware exception that from the language point of view is completely undefined. Another example of undefined behavior is when an object is modified more than once or is modified and accessed um, between two sequence points. Okay, so here is uh, an example uh, program where we have uh, the variable uh, reference, uh, the reference to variable x, so uh, which is incremented, uh, pre-incremented twice in a row. So this is undefined behavior because there is an attempt to modify the object twice between two sequence points. Uh, let us move to unspecified behavior. This is another variety of behavior that is not completely defined. So uh, this is better. Uh, it's uh, called unspecified behavior when there are two or more options to implement one thing and the um, compiler is free to choose one and uh, to choose one uh, in any given instance and the compiler doesn't need uh, even to specify 
anything about this uh, in the documentation. Here is an example. So it is unspecified behavior, the order of evaluation of operands uh, in, uh, in expressions. Okay, so uh, in, this, uh, in this example, we have a, a plus operator. You see it here in main, which calls a two function, hello and word. Okay, however, since the order of evaluation of the two sub expression is unspecified, the output may be hello word, exclamation mark, as is probably was intended by the programmer, or it may also be the other way around, word, exclamation mark, hello, blank. Okay, and what is important to be understood is that um, there is no requirement of consistency in, um, on, on the compiler. So uh, you, one, you can get one of the two possibilities. Uh, if you compile without optimization, you enable optimization, you, you have the other possibility. Or even if you duplicate, you have the same piece of code, the same addition several times in the same program, each one of those can be compiled in a different way from the other. Okay, so it's unspecified. Uh, the third variety is called the implementation defined behavior. This is uh, uh, something that everybody knows. Everybody knows that uh, C and C++ uh, can be um, uh, compiled uh, for 16-bit machines uh, or for 32-bit machines. So the size of an int is implementation defined. Every given implementation of the language um, uh, has the choice uh, about uh, these aspects. And there are many of those. There are hundreds of those. Uh, here is an example. So uh, another implementation defined aspect of C++ is whether plain char, so char without uh, the signed or unsigned qualifier, it is implementation defined whether plain char is uh, signed or unsigned. This is a program that is uh, well defined, but it is implementation defined. It tries to understand whether this particular implementation has signed plain characters uh, or unsigned plain characters. And it does so by inspecting the value of the standard macro char min, which is uh, provided in the standard header file C limits. Okay, so why are uh, C and C++ not fully defined? Why do we have uh, all these kinds of behavior that uh, uh, is not uh, fully specified in the language? And we have skipped locale specific behavior, which is not very important for what uh, uh, I want to say in this webinar, but there is also another variety, okay? So the reason is that uh, uh, this way implementing compilers uh, is uh, easier and particular implementing efficient compilers. So compilers that generate fast code is easier uh, by having this uh, uh, category of behaviors that are not uh, uh, completely defined and the other, uh, the other uh, reason is, of course, that this uh, uh, ensures uh, portability also to, for example, very small machines. Let's take an example. So an example of undefined behavior is uh, when uh, an arithmetic operation is invalid. So, for example, when you have a division by zero or it produces a result that cannot represent it in the space provided. So, for example, an overflow. Uh, of uh, signed integers. So here is an example program. The idea of the programmer was uh, to detect whether the value passed to the function is max was really the maximum uh, lowered by the type. So the programmer is reasoning in assembly code here to connect to what I started this webinar with. And reasoning in assembly code, uh, the, the uh, programmer says, OK, if I do, I do v plus 1 and I obtain something that is strictly greater than v, 
then this is uh, not uh, the, the maximum, okay? Uh, so, uh, however, if it is the maximum, I will have, uh, um, I will have uh, an uh, wraparound in the machine code, and so I will detect that this is really the maximum. However, this doesn't work in C++ and in C. It's the same. Okay, and the reason it doesn't work is that the compiler can compile this, and it, actually many compilers do compile this piece of code as if it was uh, a constant uh, return one, okay? Because the compiler has the freedom to assume that undefined behavior does not happen. And since uh, integer overflow on signed integers is in undefined behavior. The compiler has the right to assume that v plus one does not overflow. Let us consider another example. We have already seen that uh, the behavior is undefined when an attempt is made to modify a string literal. We have seen one reason. And the reason is that the string literal uh, can be stored uh, into a read-only memory segment. However, there is another reason. And the reason is that the compiler for efficiency has the right to merge the memory representation of, uh, in, uh, of uh, string literals. And for example, if we have in a program two literals, one is called tail and the other is called head tail, then the compiler can store in memory only head tail and use a pointer to the fifth character whenever it needs a representation for tail. So, if you try to change uh, one of the literals and you succeed because uh, the uh, literal is not stored in this particular implementation into a read-only segment, you are actually changing other literals. So, for this reason, the behavior is undefined whenever you try to modify a string literal. This is also very instructive. So, the um, behavior is undefined when you shift an expression by a negative shift count or by a shift count that is greater than or equal to the width in bits of the expression being shifted. Okay, so let us start from the negative part. The negative part is what might it mean to shift uh, a quantity minus two position to the left? It might mean we shifted two position to the right. However, if the language was defined in this way, the compiler would be forced for every shift to add code to test the sign of the shift count and maybe reverse the direction of the shift, which is not the spirit of C and, and it's also not the spirit of C++. The spirit of C is that whenever it is possible, a high-level construct should be mapped to one machine instruction. It is a little bit more uh, less obvious, say, uh, to understand why it is a problem shifting uh, i, uh, a quantity, uh, uh, a 32-bit unsigned uh, integer, 32 positions to the left. It is strange in a sense. One would, say, one would say, if I push 32 or more zeros from the right, the result should be zero. So I would kick off all the bits from i, and in the end, I will remain with only zero bits. No. Because for very popular architectures, like uh, the main Intel architectures, so the first thing that happens to the shift count is that it is masked. It is masked and only the five less significant bits are retained. And the reason is that it is easier this way to provide a, an upper bound, a small upper bound to the execution time of the shift instruction. We do not want to the processor to stay away, I don't know how much, because we by mistake try to shift register by one million positions. So due to this masking, shifting a quantity by 32, it's the same as uh, shifting it by 32 masked, which is the same as shifting it by zero position, which means doing nothing. So again, C and C++ 
leave this behavior undefined for speed and ease of implementation. Okay, so let's time uh, for the first poll. Are you already familiar with Misra C++? Some of you may know it. Some of you may actually use it today. Uh, others may know Misra C, but not Misra C++. Let us see. Okay, we currently have uh, 3% who never heard of it, 34% uh, I don't know it, but I know Mr. C. 37% I heard of it, but nothing more than that. And 10% uh, I know it, for example, I used it in the past. And 70% I am using it right now. Okay, good. Good, good. Thank you. So uh, let's, uh, it's now uh, time to introduce uh, Misra C and C++. First, let's start with the Misra project, which is the umbrella project that uh, uh, beyond uh, many other activities uh, is responsible for the production and maintenance of the coding standards Misra C and Misra C++. It's a project that started in 1990 uh, initially as part of a, a research program fund, uh, funded by the UK government. Now it's, uh, since many years, uh, it is self-supported uh, and it is uh, uh, not no longer a British-only project. So in the committees, there are people from all nationalities. And uh, uh, there is a company that provides a project management support, which is called Oriba Mira. Okay, uh, the first uh, publication of Misra are uh, famous. So the first one is uh, the development guidelines for vehicle-based software. So Misra, uh, the acronym is, uh, is, is an automotive acronym. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, acronym. So it started, it all started uh, uh, in the automotive sector and uh, the Development guidelines published in November 1994 are remarkable because they predate uh, by more than 10 years uh, the beginning of the work on ISO 26262. And um, the other uh, publication, the one uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, is dated April 1998, uh, and it is the first version of Misra C. So in this picture, we uh, see the uh, part of the history uh, uh, about Misra C and Misra C++. So at the beginning, Ford and Rover were working in, uh, um, in, in isolation uh, to their own coding standards for C, and they joined forces uh, under the Misra project to produce Misra C in 1998, which influenced pretty much all the coding standards that were published afterwards, including JSF++, we'll talk about it in a, in a minute, and of course, Misra C 2004, and, uh, and also Misra C++ 2008, which is the subject of this, uh, of this webinar. There was also an important contribution, and also the project was started by an initiative of the Ministry of Defense of, of uh, UK. Okay, so... Uh, let's introduce Misra C++. So one thing that uh, it is important to be understood is that uh, the weaknesses that are in C++ due to the C heritage are not easily uh, divided from the, the points of strength. So they are uh, tied together. So, for example, the fact that it is easy writing efficient compiler for almost any architecture is one of the main reasons uh, behind non-definite behavior. Here, of course, I'm talking about the backend of the compiler. I'm not saying that writing a C++ compiler, especially in C++ today, is an easy task. I'm talking just about the backend here. So, this statement is... Uh, uh, true for C, but for C++, uh, uh, it is restricted to the backend. The fact that you, you can write efficient code with no hidden cost is only achievable when you have no runtime error checking, so like in C. And the fact that there are many compilers and uh, 
uh, the language is defined by an ISO standard is another reason behind uh, non-definite behavior. So ISO standardization standard, standardizes as existing practice. So whenever two compilers made different choices concerning an aspect, uh, uh, the only way forward uh, uh, often is to leave the behavior non completely define it to give each compiler freedom to do it uh, its own way and the fact that it is uh, it is easy to access the hardware is also the same reason why it is easy to corrupt the program state for example to overwrite the stack to overwrite uh, memory structures uh, that are critical uh, that belong to other processes maybe or to the operating system the fact that you can write compact code is also the reason why the language can be so easily misunderstood and misused and used to write pretty obscure code. Okay, so several features of C and C++ conflict with safety and security. So what is the solution? The solution adopted by industry is to use language subsets. This is called language subsetting. You do not program your application in C++. You program your application in a, in a subset of C++. And where the possibility of bad things happening is reduced. So language subsetting is mandated or recommended by all safety and security related industry, industrial standards. And uh, today, is the most, uh, my opinion is that the most authoritative language subset for the C++ programming language is Misra C++. So uh, a little bit more about the history of Misra C++. So Misra C was uh, already well established and uh, it already uh, went beyond the automotive sector. So Misra C and also Misra C++ today is really uh, uh, they are really coding standards that are not tied to any industry sector. They are adopted in, in, in all industry sectors. So there was input uh, from the UK Ministry of Defense uh, who approached the MISRA to uh, ask whether there were plans to produce something similar for C++. There were no active plans at the moment, uh, so what happened is that three members of the Misra C working group uh, and two others uh, established uh, the first, uh, the very first uh, uh, Misra C++ uh, working group. The aim was to produce uh, something similar to uh, Misra C, uh, but for a C++ 2003 to ensure. Uh, as much consistency as possible between Misra C and Misra C++ because, of course, uh, C and C++ uh, have the nice thing that they are largely interoperable. You can mix, uh, a system can be written partly in C and partly in C++. So it is, uh, of course, a requirement that Misra C and Misra C++ uh, uh, share this kind of compatibility. Uh, the, another requirement was, of course, to satisfy the, the requirements of the Ministry of Defense. Uh, we will have a slide on this. And uh, make sure that the subset was suitable for use uh, uh, in, in the development of system with high integrity or high reliability requirements. Okay. So... The uh, idea was to introduce rules to prevent undefined and unspecified behavior, to control the use of implementation defined behavior, to ensure that uh, uh, the developers are not confused about the dialect they are using to program the system, and also to ensure portability to some degree. Uh, the rules should enforce strong typing, uh, negate the effect of implicit type conversion, so make sure that uh, uh, their conversions, uh, um, even when they are uh, implicit, uh, do not cause problem. Restrict the use of explicit type conversion, rule out some instances of common programming errors, uh, mandate the use of compiled statement uh, in uh, um, selection and iteration statement and prevent the accidental use of equality instead uh, of assignment instead of equality. The 
Ministry of Defense was mainly interested in ensuring uh, that uh, the code uh, did not contain instances of undefined and unspecified behavior. So Misra C already covered these areas. And uh, it, one uh, important factor in uh, uh, covering this area was that uh, the C standard explicitly lists all the instances of undefined and unspecified behavior. However, the C++ standard did not and does not enumerate this behavior. So in order to understand what they are, you really have to go through the, I don't know how many pages is the C++ standard today, but on the order of a thousand, if not two thousand. And um, so this was the contribution of the Ministry of Defense. The, the, the Ministry of Defense uh, uh, went through the C++ standard to uh, explicitly list uh, the all instances of undefined and uh, unspecified behavior. There were other inputs to MISRA C++. I already mentioned uh, in a slide uh, JSF++. This is uh, a coding, a proprietary coding standard uh, publicly available by Lockheed Martin, which was adopted for a particular program uh, in, in uh, aviation, and this coding standard was heavily based, uh, is heavily based uh, in MISRA C 1998. JSF++ is no longer maintained. And JSF++ started from MISRA C 1998 and added many rules to cover uh, aspects of C++. Uh, so language subsetting plus some rules uh, uh, with coding styles uh, and so on. So. The C++ specific rules uh, uh, in JSF++ were reviewed during the development of MISRA C++ and uh, uh, Stroop Troop was involved in uh, the development of JSF++, so this uh, was uh, clearly considered as a, an authoritative source. Okay, so the rules in MISRA C++ were written so that they have a strong rationale. So uh, for each rule, it is uh, explained uh, uh, what are the bad things that the rule is meant to prevent. Uh, examples both of compliant code and non-compliant code were uh, added, were appropriated, and also exceptions uh, were provided for uh, use cases that are known uh, not to uh, give problems. Okay, here is how the rules uh, are presented uh, in MISRA C++ 2008. So um, the, the rule um, starts uh, with uh, a rectangle like this one. So there is the word rule, then there is a number, a category, and headline text, and then issue reference and normative text. So let us review this uh, um, um, in the next slide. So um, every rule has a unique number, which consists of three parts. So AA, BB, CC. AA, BB gives a section number within C++ 2003 to which the rule uh, relates. Okay, so the standard is divided in chapters and sections. So these are reported in the rule uh, identifier. And CC is a sequential number for rules related to the uh, section AABB. There are exceptions. So uh, the number zero is used to um, encode uh, rules, uh, uh, rule numbers of the form uh, zero BB, where uh, the the rule contains general guidelines, uh, guidance that does not relate to any specific area within the standard. So, um, and uh, the pattern AA0 is used whenever the rule uh, is related with uh, a, a particular area of the standard, but not to a specific uh, subsection in the standard. The, um, MISRA C++ rule have a category uh, which is either required, advisory, or document. A required rule uh, is a rule that you have to comply with unless you write a formal deviation. A formal deviation 
is a, a piece of text where you explain why in a certain place in your project or maybe uh, in, in the, the entire project or in other parts of the project, you are not complying to a rule and you provide a, an explanation that makes sense to your peer. So you have to convince uh, the peer of you that uh, you are deviating, but basically there are no problems in doing so. Advisory rules are recommendation. They should be followed as far as practical, and uh, you don't need formal deviation if you do not comply to those, but at the end of the project, in order to produce a claim of MISRA C++ compliance, you have to list all your non-compliances. And the third category is document. These are mandatory requirements that uh, are placed on the developer whenever you use a certain feature in your code. So deviation is not permitted. If you are asked to document something, you have to document something, okay? There are no other grading of importance of the rules in Misra C++. So all the required rules are of equal importance as all, all advisory and all the document ones. So uh, there is no other grading. The headline is just a short summary of the rule. So the headline is not the full rule. It's simply a compromise. So nobody remembers what is uh, rule uh, AA-BB-CC, but if you are familiar with the coding standard and you read the headline, you are quickly reminded of what the rule is about. But in order to understand properly the rule, you have to study the entire rule description, which may be one or even two pages. Um, MISA C++ rules are classified as decidable or undecidable. So they are decidable when there exists an algorithm that for each source program, giving enough resources, so memory and time, we always produce a yes or no answer in finite time, okay? Uh, it is marked undecidable when such an algorithm does not and will never exist. So it is a, a fact of this universe that most interesting program properties are undecidable. For example, whether a division by zero is possible or not is undecidable. Whether a buffer overflow is possible or not, it's undecidable. Um, Limitation of available resources might prevent the use of an exact algorithm even when the rules are decidable. So the fact that an algorithm exists is one thing, but for example, uh, if the complexity is cubic in the number of, say, lines in the program, it is not practical. Practical. So the exact algorithm exists, but you cannot use it in a practical static analyzer. So let us see a uh, few examples of MISRA C++ rule, uh, just to give you an idea of what the rules might look like. Okay, so rule 3-9-2, type depths that indicate size and sign and this should be used in place of the basic numerical type. So you shouldn't use short, int, long. With an advisory rule, it is decidable and you can find all the violation examining a single translation unit at a time. So the reason we have this rule is that, of course, being aware of signiness and size uh, is crucial. You have to know how much storage do you need. You have to, if the variable cannot uh, is not wide enough to uh, uh, use uh, to sorry to store all the bits you want uh, you need then. Uh, of course, it's not good. And also you want to know what are the storage requirements of your, of your program. And also uh, complying to this rule uh, greatly improves uh, portability, even though it does not fully guarantee portability because uh, integer promotion may or may not take place depending on the size of int. So it's uh, C and C++ are tricky languages from this point of view. Uh, another uh, important rule is uh, rule 101. All code should be written in C++ 2003. 
and should comply to the standards. This is required, and it is decidable and single translation unit. And the reason is that if you use uh, uh, features that are not present uh, in uh, C++ 2003, maybe because they have been introduced later, or maybe because they are extensions in your compiler, then these features had not been considered when de developing the MISRA rules. Not only this, but when a translation limit is exceeded, a conforming implementation doesn't need to generate a diagnostic. So you might be exposed without knowing. Uh, for those of you who don't know what is a translation limit, so uh, a translation limit is some minimal quantity that uh, the compiler uh, should be able to treat in order to be legitimately called the C++ compiler. For example, uh, the depth uh, uh, up to which you can nest uh, uh, conditional inclusion directives uh, in your code. So if, sharp if, sharp if, def, sharp if, and def, okay, you can nest them. Uh, however, the compiler is free to only support until, say, nine levels of, the, of nesting. This is a translation limit. The compiler may uh, not be able to go beyond without even giving you a diagnostic. For a more interesting uh, uh, instance of this, for example, the significance of identifiers due to the limitations of some linkers, uh, for example, there is a, a minimal uh, length uh, for, of, for the significance of uh, identifiers that uh, the linker ma uh, has to support in order to be usable in connection with C++, but no more than this. So uh, if, uh, say, now I don't remember by heart what is the translation limit for C++ 2003, maybe, I don't know, uh, 63... Uh, characters or 128. However, in C++, uh, it is quite easy to end up with uh, very long uh, external symbols at the linker level. So, and in addition, it is possible, and it happens quite often, that some implementations that, technically speaking, are non-conforming, well, they fail to diagnose constant violations. So they accept code that they should not accept. And uh, the object codes I generate from this erroneous input code, you basically don't know. So this is the reason why there is rule 101. So the program should only use features in C++03, should not exceed the implementation translation limit, may use language extension, okay? It should not contain any violation of the language syntax and any violation of the constraints in the syntax. Let's move to another rule. So I have chosen uh, simple rules for this uh, webinar because we don't have much time. So this uh, is, is a rule about comments. So one would say, hey, what's the problem with comments? There are problems with comments. This rule 271 says the character sequence uh, uh, slash star should not be used within a C style comment. And why this? Because uh, nesting of these kind of comments is not uh, supported. And so this can give rise uh, to dangerous things like the one uh, which is exemplified uh, here. So we have a function which is called critical function because it's crucial for this function to be called at that point in the program. However, just because the programmer forgot or accidentally removed the closing star slash in the line before the function call, this function will not be called. It will actually not even be seen by later stage of the compiler, okay? So uh, in some cases, you will not even get a warning. Uh, rule 501, this has to do with unspecified behavior, so it matches what we have seen in the initial part of the webinar, the value of an expression and its persistent side effects shall be the same under all permitted evaluation order. 
This is because of uh, unspecified behavior. So we'll see example about this. But uh, uh, violating this rule is uh, also uh, exposes you to undefined behavior. I have already uh, said that modifying an object more than once between two sequence points is undefined behavior. And similarly, there is uh, an undefined behavior associated to modifying and reading an object at the same time, unless reading is necessary to store in the object. So not, not going uh, in details in this, okay? So let us see an example. Here, we have uh, a program that uh, uh, is violating uh, the rule, and uh, there is uh, an unspecified behavior and uh, as is the one that we have already seen. So the order of evaluation of sub-expression is unspecified. So we don't know whether uh, which one uh, will be the value that we will subtract uh, to and the one to which, from which we subtract. So the result uh, in this uh, example can be one or minus one, depending on the evaluation order. So what is the solution? The solution is to introduce a temporary variable so that we force the exact sequence of events and no decent compiler will let you pay any price for having introduced the temporary variable V. Uh, another uh, uh, thing uh, that is uh, unspecified is the order in which the argument to function and method calls are evaluated. So this example is very similar to the, the one above. This uh, exploits uh, the unspecified behavior concerning the actual arguments of function and method calls. And the result may be uh, different depending on something that is completely beyond the control of the programmer. The solution, again, is to introduce a temporary variable. Third example, which uh, is, is similar, but it, uh, it is um, conceived so that people working in embedded system will immediately recognize it. So here we have uh, uh, two uh, volatile uh, variables that are accessed, and uh, a volatile variable uh, reading a volatile variable may uh, uh, have uh, side effects. And so since uh, we have seen that it is unspecified, uh, the order of evaluation, we don't know which side effect is triggered first, whether first is triggered the side effect uh, uh, tied to the uh, TCNT1 variable or the one tied to TCNT2. So again, the solution is to introduce temporary variables. In this example, for a change, we introduce two temporary variables. One could have been enough, but here is a solution that is a little bit more elegant, and this uh, is uh, an effective way to comply to the rule and uh, force uh, the sequence uh, that uh, we want uh, uh, about the side effects. Okay, so uh, understanding Misra C++. Misra C++ is part of a project, so uh, of a process, and the process of documented software development. So in, a, in such a process, uh, you must have software requirements. Software requirements should be complete and ambiguous and correct. And you have to do a series of activities that are uh, beyond uh, the scope uh, of uh, uh, Misra C++. Misra C++ says that you must have a software development process in place. It gives some constraints, but it doesn't say uh, more about this because this is uh, something that is left to the functional safety standard. One important thing is that Misra C++ should be used before the code reaches the review and the unit testing phases. So unfortunately, it is often the case that people uh, start worrying about MISRA compliance at the end of the project. However, if they have already done uh, reviews and uh, testing phases and uh, they uh, need to change the code in order to ensure MISRA C++ compliance, then a lot of reworking and retesting must be expected. Okay, so 
as I said, the full requirements for safety-related software development is, uh, are outside the scope of MISO C++, and they are left to the uh, functional safety standards that are uh, in force in each uh, industry sector. And this is time for the second poll. Which functional safety standards are relevant to you? And while uh, Lavinia launches uh, the poll, let me remind you that uh, we have a YouTube channel. And one thing that is uh, very important uh, in uh, uh, functional safety standards is, is concerning the use of tools. Okay. And uh, tools, uh, in order to be used in safety related development, need to be qualified. So, one of the things you will find on our YouTube channel is a webinar precisely on this. Okay, Roberta, so we've got 2% EN5128, 15% IEC61508, 4% IEC62304, uh, and uh, the great majority, in fact, is ISO 26262, and 13% uh, replied others. Okay, so the good, so the advice is to uh, subscribe the YouTube channel also because we will start uh, a series of very short uh, videos uh, which will not uh, be announced and will simply be published uh, on the YouTube channel. So if you subscribe, you will get a notification of those. Okay, so MISRA C++ is error prevention, is not bug finding. Okay, so for one thing, it cannot be separated from the process of documented software development it is part of. And uh, to start with, uh, the most important difference about uh, between uh, MISO C++ compliance and bug findings is that violation of a guideline is not necessarily a software error. Okay, for example, there is nothing intrinsically wrong about converting an integer constant to a pointer especially when you need it to address memory mapped registers, okay? However, since this kind of conversions, integers to pointers, are implementation defined, and they also have unspecified behaviors, okay, there is a rule in MISRA C++ that suggests avoiding them everywhere apart from the very specific occasions in which you need it. You need it, and you can, you have an argument. Uh, for the safety of such an operation. So the deviation process is an essential part of MISRA C++. And the point of the guideline is almost never, you should not do that. The point is that, look, this is dangerous. So you may do it if it is needed, if it is safe. And if you, do, you can explain quickly to a peer of you that it is both needed and safe. It's, if it takes half an hour to explain, it's not good. So it must be obviously good, okay? One useful way to think about MISRA C++ and the process, uh, corresponding process, is to consider them as an effective way of conducting a guided peer review. So in an in a ordinary peer review, you would be sitting with your colleagues uh, in front of a screen and you will ask questions about the code and uh, with MISRA C++, you do the same, but if you have a good quality tool, it will be the tool to point uh, out to you and your colleague points uh, that uh, are suspicious, okay? And uh, if you adhere to MISRA C++, you will be able to rule out many of the C++ traps and pitfalls, okay? And another thing that differentiates very much uh, MISRA C++ compliance from bug finding, it's a different attitude. So the users of bug finders are tolerant about false negatives and completely intolerant about false positives. So if the tool gives a false positive, for example, the compiler gives a false positive, they become mad about it. And uh, you can see this if you follow, as I do, the development of GCC or uh, CLang, you will see that as soon as there is a false positive report, they will change anything independently of whether they are introducing false negatives or not. And this is, of course, not the right mindset for uh, a 
safety related development. So it's true that uh, false positives are a nuisance, but if you have false negatives, it means that you have to do something else because the uh, um, the thing uh, is not uh, is not uh, uh, acceptable. So the, the fact that you have uh, uh, violations, okay. So uh, another aspect that places Mises C++ in a different sector is the importance given to the reviews. So code reviews, reviews of the code against design documents, and reviews of the design documents against requirement. In fact, there are many MISRA rules that have to do with code readability and understandability. Okay, so what does it uh, mean to be MISRA compliant? There is now a new version of the document called MISRA Compliance. The first version was published in 2016. The new version has just been published, so 2020. It explains what do you have to do in order to claim MISRA Compliance for a project. Okay, so this is compatible with all existing and future version of MISRA C and MISRA C++. For the time being, it's optional. However, it is highly recommended because it simplifies things a lot. Okay, it will be mandatory for all future versions of MISRA C and MISRA C++. So let's talk about now the future of MISRA C++ and we will talk about the future starting talking about the past. Okay, so MISRA C++ was published in 2008 and then there was a long period of inactivity because of lack of members. So. Uh, members of the MISRA C and the MISRA C++ uh, working groups, they are volunteer. If there are no volunteers, there is no way this can make progress. So the, the group was reformed in 2014 with the aim of, with several aims, so adding support for C++14, improvement uh, in document quality to uh, follow the evolution of MISRA C 2012, adding guidance for use of dynamic memory, which is so uh, tied with some C++ uh, constructs and so on. So, uh, however, uh, the, an organization which you, many of you will know called AutoSAR could not wait for a, uh, uh, an update uh, to uh, MISRA C++ to be published. And so they uh, published uh, um, in, uh, an AutoSAR C++ coding standard, which is largely uh, inspired by uh, MISRA C++ 2008 and, uh, and that uh, was uh, done because uh, uh, there was demand for such a coding standard. So uh, there has been a, a context between MISRA C++ and, and AutoSAR have started in April 2017 and after a few meetings, it was decided that AutoSAR C++ will be merged into the next uh, uh, version of MISRA C++. And uh, the work uh, started immediately and work in other areas was suspended in order to make this the uh, priority. Okay, so in October 2018, there was a formal handover from AutoSAR to MISRA. There has been a press release announcing that uh, MISRA C++ uh, and a working group in which uh, members of the AutoSAR C++ uh, working group have, uh, uh, are participating will be in charge of the next uh, uh, version of uh, MISRA uh, C++. And uh, an initial review of uh, uh, AutoSAR C++ was uh, uh, completed uh, last year. And then uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, steps have been made uh, in the merge uh, process. So this uh, is a joint press release. Uh, I will just, I just show it. So it's a literal, literally taken from the from the uh, internet. Uh, so the, the main thing is that MISRA will merge the AutoSAR guidelines and there will be no further development of AutoSAR uh, 
C++, but uh, as I said, uh, team members uh, that developed AutoSAR C++ are now uh, key players uh, in the MISRA working group. And actually now the MISRA C++ working group has a lot of participation. So there are, there is a lot of uh, uh, interested uh, people and there is a significant activity. So the conclusion of the document review work was that some rules are the same as those of MISRA C++ 2008. Some rules are similar. Some rules have major differences, okay? And in addition, in AutoSAR, there are uh, additional rules. So there are 200 more rules than in MISRA C++ uh, 2008. Um, most of them are related to language subsetting. Some are related to software design. Some are related to coding style. And some are related to software development process. So uh, all the differences had to be identified analyzed and understood, of course, some changes have been rejected, many changes have been accepted, and some of the changes that were done in AutoSAR C++ have led to new ideas for, for uh, MISRA guidelines, which will not uh, typically appear in the next update due to time constraints. The uh, guidelines uh, in uh, AutoSAR C++ related to software design uh, uh, code style and software development process will generally not be included in uh, uh, MISRA C++ because uh, uh, MISRA, uh, MISRA leaves this uh, to individual uh, organizations. So uh, ideally, only those that have to do with language subsetting uh, will enter into MISRA, MISRA C++. And uh, the concerns covered by the other new rules will be supported in the next version of MISRA C++. So notice the difference. It is not the case that, uh, it is not said that uh, the rules will uh, be moved from AutoSAR C++ to MISRA C++. It's that there will be rules in MISRA C++ that will address the same concerns. So uh, the rules uh, may be different. Okay. So the structure of the new MISRA C++ uh, uh, coding standard, uh, which is uh, named 202X, where X uh, is still uh, unknown. So the structure will be similar to that of MISRA C 2012. And uh, there will be uh, a work, a significant work to ensure consistency with the MISRA terminology and also a lot of editorial work, which is not technical work, but still it's work that takes a lot of time. So the plan in December 2019 was this one. Now uh, you all know what happened. So uh, uh, things uh, in, in all sectors in our lives uh, have been delayed by several months. Uh, so now these plans uh, have to be revised. There is some hope to have the final draft ready by the beginning of 2021. So uh, after the publication of MISRA C++ uh, 202X, the plan is to uh, do the same as uh, we are doing in the MISRA C working group. So to... Uh, <clears throat> add the coverage for, for more and more language features. So improvement in the treatment of the standard and template libraries, more consideration given to host the application. So uh, application that run with, uh, uh, on top of an operating system and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So it's late, I have to run. Uh, also, uh, supported documents are planned uh, as it was done for MISRA C. So, as you know, MISRA uh, has the position that uh, uh, the MISRA standards uh, do cover also security requirements. So, as uh, uh, the MISRA C working group has uh, published the uh, matrices uh, explaining how MISRA C covers CERT C. So the same thing will be done for MISRA C++ with respect to CERT C++. 
Uh, it is also planned to uh, develop in, in, to de in, uh, it is planned to develop uh, uh, best practice guidance document on uh, very hot topics like the use of dynamic memory, the use of exception angling, and class design, for example. So time to conclude, I'm a bit late, sorry. So C++ is increasingly used uh, for the programming of embedded system, even though the fast, uh, too fast evolution of the language has scared away several players. So some advantage of C++ come with corresponding disadvantages and mainly arising from the C legacy. And so language subsetting is crucial. And Mitra C++ is, uh, my opinion, the most authoritative subset of C++ for the development of high integrity embedded system. There is a bug in the slide, of course. So it's a subset of C++. Mitra C++ is a uh, part of a software development process that has very little to do with bug finding. And the next edition of Misra C++ will incorporate the uh, concerns addressed by the language subset guidelines of Autosar C++. And if there are questions, I will be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Roberto. So question number one. How many rules are there in Mitra C++? Okay, 228 uh, rules uh, in uh, Mitra C++. Okay, Roberto. Second question. Do you recommend adopting Autosar C++? So, uh, if, if you means me, uh, I, I do not recommend adopting Autosar C++ for... Uh, for Two reasons. So the first reason is that uh, uh, it is something that will be completely replaced by the next version of Misra C++. And since uh, it is uh, anticipated that uh, many rules will change, um, doing so is expensive. As I said, uh, um, the Autosar C++ coding standard has... Uh, around 200 rules more than Misra C++ uh, 2008. So um, this is a, a lot of work for people wishing to comply. And uh, uh, at least for safety related development, uh, I don't think there is uh, uh, enough incentive to do so. So let me explain. Uh, the, the main reason behind adopting uh, uh, Autosar C++ uh, uh, would be to use uh, uh, features from C++ 11 or C++ 14. Uh, however, there are features that are some of the new features are not adequate for safety related development and also one thing that has to be taken into account is that uh, compilers have defects. So the industry is conservative and it is correctly conservative because when, it, uh, uh, when, when you consider uh, the fact that you depend to some extent on the correctness of the compiler, using features that have not been tested enough, that have not been implemented by enough compilers is a risk. Okay. So, if you need some things of C++11 or C++14, my advice, especially if you work in safety-related systems, would be to stick to Misra C++2008 to raise deviations for the features you need, absolutely need, and those that are safe for use are quite easy to justify. And, and I think that this will be more effective way of spending your time. And uh, then uh, uh, hopefully at the beginning of 2021, we will have the new version of Misra C++ and we will have a, a, a solid ground on which to, to go further. Uh, so um, recommended code style and naming convention like Hungarian notation. Okay, so uh, Misra, all the Misra coding standards uh, do 
recommend that every organization has a, a coding style that is enforced and checked. Uh, but it leaves the choice of the coding style and naming a convention to each individual organization. Because this is uh, a matter of style, is a matter of preference. So um, this recommendation is not done by uh, uh, MISRA. For those who don't know what uh, Hungarian notation here is, is uh, a notation whereby uh, information and by, about the type and about the content uh, of a variable is uh, included in the name. So it's a, a quite old idea. Uh, it, it may make sense in some contexts. Uh, I would not generally recommend uh, uh, this uh, over other possibilities. So what, uh, uh, what here uh, at Bagsang we recommend, we, have, uh, uh, we recommend using the BAR C2018 coding standard because uh, it exists because uh, it has an history of use uh, and we developed the checkers for uh, enforcing it uh, uh, in, in your code. So the, the coding guidelines, uh, sorry, the coding style in bar C 2018, uh, even though there is a C in the name, is largely applicable to C++. Uh, to C++ as, as well. For the naming convention in the Eclair tool, uh, there are uh, services uh, in which uh, you can specify the names uh, you intend to use. This supports uh, many possible conventions uh, because it supports, for example, dependency on the type and, and on the kind of the object. So you can, if you want uh, to uh, implement uh, to use uh, Hungarian notation in your code, you can do it uh, by configuring the general checkers provided by Eclair. Okay, so uh, what are your considerations to avoid compiler dependency? Uh, let me see. Uh, of course, uh, the most advantage, uh, the most advanced version of the standard uh, for C++ you stick to will uh, reduce your choices. So if you, stick to C++ 2003, you will have more chances to find the compilers that do the right thing uh, with your code. The more advanced, uh, the more advanced uh, rules, uh, sorry, the more advanced uh, language construct you use, uh, for example, those introduced in C++ 14 or even C++ 17, the risk of uh, uh, having a, a compiler that uh, has bugs or having two compilers, two different compilers producing different results is higher. So for C++, even possibly even more than uh, in C, it is crucial if you do safety-related development to qualify your compiler. So you should, uh, um, again, I can... Uh, I, I, I suggest you go to the YouTube channel uh, and uh, look at the video uh, made uh, in occasion of the webinar on tool qualification. There I say more about uh, tool qualification, including compiler qualification. Okay, thank you, Roberto. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Of course, if you have more questions, you can always drop us an email at infobuxen.com. Also, if you'd like to see this webinar again, or as Roberto just said, share it with your colleagues, you can head over to our YouTube channel. I shared the link in the chat, and we will send you the link as well in the post-webinar mailing. In general, there you will find uh, all previous and future webinars. Uh, if Misrasi competence is relevant uh, to you in your work, you might not want to miss next webinar um, because because we will take a non-compliant project and demonstrate step by step how to make it compliant in less than one hour. So that is going to be fun. All it right, a small project, of course. Yeah, a of very course. small project. Yeah. <laughs> that was ambitious. Okay. All right then. So thanks again, everyone, and we hope to see you all next week. Bye bye. Bye bye.